Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a guest who has worked in various sectors throughout their career, from nonprofit to for profit to private sector to public sector. And that is what I want to talk about today. What is the difference between the public sector and the private sector? And why is it important and why should an entrepreneur care? The public sector loosely known as the state sector, is part of the economy that encompasses of both public service and public entities. Examples include military, public transportation, public education, health care, elected public officials, even infrastructure. Think about all those beautifully timed highway construction work, or sewers, or light poles, and so on. Agencies that come to mind are the IRS, the FBI, the Federal Reserve Board. Those are all public sector agencies. The private sector, also loosely known as the citizen sector, is the part of the economy that is owned by private groups, usually as a means to establish for-profit or non-profit rather than being owned by the government. Nike, Apple, Intel, Tesla, these are all organizations in the private sector. Nonprofits are a little bit more unique. And then there is a third sector called the volunteer sector or NGOs, non government organization, which encompasses organizations such as the Red Cross and Doctors Without Borders. These classification depends on each organization. So technically, nonprofits could be a public charity or a private foundation. An example of this is United Way is a private foundation that supports public charities. So why is this important? According to the Balanced Small Business, employment differs between the public and private sector. The Department of Labor distinguishes between the two types of employees for specific regulations like mill break requirements and labor laws, like the Occupational Safety and Health Act, or OSHA, for example. The major employment law, the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA, covers only employees in the private sector companies. In the public sector, civil service employees, those who work for federal, state, or local government agencies, receive pay and benefits under a different system than the private employees. Federal employees and the U.S. government, for example, work under the federal civil service system, which includes classifications of positions to ensure equality pay and equality work across the federal agencies. In the private sector, employees have more flexibility. Each employer can set its own employment rules as long as they abide by the federal and state employment laws like OSHA, wage and hour laws, and equal pay and benefit laws. Understanding ownership between the private and public sector is important too. Public sector and companies are owned and managed by the government, while private companies are owned and managed by private individuals and private companies. If you own a stock, you own part of a company. Congratulations, you're an entrepreneur. Okay, maybe it's not quite the same, but hopefully this quick overview of private and public sector helps you determine where you want to see your line of work end up. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. clients in highly regulated sectors such as healthcare, education, government, and cannabis. With experience helping organizations tell compelling brand stories and driving growth, please welcome the owner of Tiller, Jess Colombo. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with the owner, Jessica Colombo of Tiller. I'm very excited about this one because I actually have worked with this individual for so long. And then I've actually got to see this individual progress into this, into this, you know, entrepreneurship role. 
So Jess, mm-hmm. how are we doing? I'm I'm as good as I can be. How are... <laughs> it's, it's pandemic no, season. I'm still. A lo- <laughs> Yes, but I'm no, I'm totally delighted to be here with you. Thanks for having me. No, I'm excited. I'm I'm really excited because as I was mentioning yeah. earlier, you know, you and I have known each other for years. Uh we've worked, yeah. you know, just literally next door to each other in the same office in corporate America for yes. some time. And yes. I you know, I'm really excited about this story because you you I mean, were in corporate America, you were, you know, mm-hmm. very you're rising pretty quickly in the ranks, and then you said, you know, mm-hmm. I want to start my own thing. Now before mm-hmm. we get into all that Let's introduce yeah. the world to Jess Colombo. Cool. Okay. Give us a little background. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. Okay. I'll try to um, – Spot. My motto is be, br- be brief, be bright, be gone. So that's what I'm going to try to do. Um, uh, let's see. Graduate. I was a poetry major, much to my parents' disappointment, at a very expensive liberal arts college. And um, came out and said, oh, I want to write for a living, which um, sounded pretty cuckoo. And actually got in touch with um, a staffing firm here in Portland and said, hey, can you stick me in any business that will have me if they pay me to write? And um, they put me at a really phenomenal, supportive uh, boutique PR agency. And I had never gone to school for PR. I didn't really have an understanding of what that looked like. But it was right at the kind of upward slope of social. Um, so I was there as Facebook opened up from college kids to brands and as Twitter kind of came online. Um, and as the youngest kid at a creative agency, I had the opportunity and the trust from leadership to say, hey, I think there's something to this and we should check it out. And can I play in this space and start selling it to clients? So about 15 years ago now, um, I started doing social for brands um, that were really mission driven. And then 15 years later, I have this kind of unique privilege of doing that um, on my own. But lots of twists and turns along the way. I've been agency side and in-house, large organizations and smaller ones. Um, and I think the, the thread maybe is um, somebody recently was working on a rebrand for me and, and she said, I think you're the Brene Brown of digital marketing. <laughs> and I totally <laughs> cringed at that and then also felt absolutely <laughs> you know, um, humbled and, and, um, and flattered by it. But, um, I think my background is, um, is around, let's see, we can edit some of this out, but, (laughs) um, (laughs) but I'm interested in the internet being, um, still at this point in its evolution, a place for good and a place to connect human beings to other human beings. So that's what I get to do now, and I'm really grateful for it. Nice. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about what it is you do now. What for the cool. listeners at home? What is Tiller? What does it do? Yeah, you bet. Um, six years ago, I left corporate America and said, "Oh, I want to do my own thing and um, and teach people how to use social and digital platforms to connect humans and tell really great stories." And uh, Tiller still gets to do that. I say I accidentally built the agency, the marketing and communications agency that is Tiller, because that wasn't necessarily my explicit intention when I left corporate. Um, I said, I know I want to do this. And then I was just really lucky to have clients say, we not only are buying kind of what you're selling, uh, but we want you to do it for us. And at the time, when I was trying to pay a mortgage and and, um, kind of get my footing, I also had... um, a lot of really talented people around me um, who could do kind of complimentary services and could do a lot of the execution. So um, six years later, I have an agency and we do marketing and communications for regulated industries. So I would say 70% of our clientele is healthcare, but also um, higher ed and government, nonprofit, financial services, and cannabis every once in a while when we get a grown up client in that space. But um, marketing communications, a lot of it is focused in the digital social space. And then over the last few years, um, we've really built a book of business on the crisis um, end, too. So uh, supporting executives and teams um, as they show up and try to support um, their own employees, but also um, how we de-escalate and manage really tricky stuff that's happening across the Internet. So I jokingly say that as a consultant, I help people not get sued for silly things they say online. Keeps it interesting. Yeah. I think some people probably need that a little bit more than others. I'm sure. (laughs) 
Oh my goodness, we've been busy. I don't know if you can't. <laughs> People at home during this pandemic, man, we got Twitter fingers. Yeah. We ain't got much to do. <laughs> oh my gosh. So let's talk about yeah. how the the concept kind of created a, a started a little bit because you mentioned you were in corporate America and then you decided yeah. to leave. So how did how did the concept come together and, and why did you decide to leave corporate America? I yeah. Ooh. Um I love talking about what I thought I was going to do and, and where I am now because it opens up a larger kind of give yourself permission to change course anytime for any reason. Um, if as you're building your practice, you realize that it isn't adding to your life in terms of kind of your joy or your finances or your the time you get to spend with the people that you care about or the types of work that you want to dig into or the strengths of your professional services, then you get to change course. But I didn't give myself a lot of permission and I, I would tell you know entrepreneurs to do that. You get really worried about your elevator pitch. Well, I'm going to tell people this is what I do and why I do it and how I do it. And then life changes and the world changes and you might want to go back in house or you might want to do something else. So when I left corporate, um, I had was in a position after a number of years of building there where my kind of values and the work that I wanted to do wasn't necessarily aligned with, you know, the structure and the people that were in place anymore. And so I had the really unique gift um, where I was able to go half time at corporate. So I powered down, but I still had income. I still had benefits. And I started to go um, identify some independent clients that I could bring on. So I was, I was still able to, you know, subsidize um, my household while I went and built the practice. But I thought I was going to leave corporate and do um, continuing medical education training, CME training for healthcare providers on social and digital. I knew that there was this really interesting intersection of ethics and kind of professional ethics and online. Um, and a lot of folks were aching for that kind of education. And I was able to build that when I was in-house um, with some organizations. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go out there and I don't have to go get that business, right? Um, our clinical providers, our doctors, our nurses, our pharmacists, they all need to get continuing medical education credit. That's so there's true. my sales yes. pipeline. Yeah. I'll just go and get accredited to do that. I'll have the material, the education training material to do that. Um, I started doing informational interviews with people and realized what the upfront cost of that would be um, and kind of the logistics of setting up that kind of service offering. And it was, I couldn't afford to do it. Um, so I started taking stuff that people knew me for instead, which was really social media strategy and social consulting and, and things like that. Um, thinking, oh, I'll get back to that. I'll get back to that. But I named my, my the first iteration of the business MedEd Digital. I was doing medical education okay. specific to the digital space. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, it's a total like mouthful. Nobody <laughs> likes that. It's not a good, it's like it sucks so much. Like, what a beautiful thing, you know? Like, try it and fall on your face and try something else. I love and, it. I um, love the idea. So there was a, there's been a lot of pivoting. And, um, and yeah, in six years, um, it's evolved. MedEd, um, then we launched Tiller maybe four years ago as a separate practice altogether. Um, so as the legalization of cannabis was kind of coming to pass here in the Northwest, um, I've got a lot of personal values alignment with um, addressing the opioid epidemic. And we were seeing that every state that was legalizing saw an organic drop in opioid use and thought, ooh, if this is something that's in line with our values, let's go get it. But as soon as I started taking on cannabis clients, even really mission driven, um, you know, public health oriented campaigns, my healthcare and other regulated clients got nervous and they said, ooh, we're oh, uncomfortable being associated with that. Um, and so I had to, I had to launch a separate practice altogether, which was Tiller. Um, now, a few years later, there's, you know, kind of socially, culturally, everything has evolved to a place where right. we can be one practice that everybody can be under one roof. Interesting. That's yeah, kind of, that's it's kind been of, a ride. Yeah, that, that's kind of interesting too, how, you know, other organizations obviously they feel like, you know, they're creating this partnership with you, right. To create mm -hmm. your content. Yeah. And so your affiliations is also yeah. looked at with very interesting for, you know, small business owners to think about as well. You know, you mentioned too, uh, you kind of worked with a lot of providers from a CME education. So for those at home, CME stands for continuing medical education. Um, and these providers need it on an annual basis. You know, some need um, surgeons need a specific amount of hours versus general practice. 
Now you mentioned because a lot of there's a lot of providers and a lot of you know just normal people in general, just everybody's on the internet, mm-hmm. right? What is yeah. and you you kind of mentioned you you teach them on some uh, ethics. What are what are some nuggets that some folks should kind of think about? What are maybe like some things that you see often that you try to tell mm-hmm. folks to like avoid? Oh yeah. Uh, oh my gosh, that is the, that's been kind of my joy point, um, in the practice as we've, you know, shifted and taken and launched new arms of the business. And I've done consulting in addition to agency management, the teaching is my favorite, favorite thing. Um, because when you're teaching, you're also learning. And in the last two years, the things that I was teaching and kind of hitting on from clinical education of here's the opportunity of being in the social space for you to connect with patients, for you to do continuing education, to, for you to understand the patient, you know, psychographics of who you're serving, for you to continue to find research collaboration, all these phenomenal opportunities of clinical professionals being in the social and digital space. When COVID hit, um, the stakes became just astronomically higher. And you a lot of risk that wasn't there. And there was a ton of risk before. And that's what I would, I would teach. Here's how we can, I can empower you to engage safely in this space so that you feel really confident to go do that. And, and then inherently it, it creates this halo for the institution that you work at, right? If I've got all my subject matter experts going and, and doing really great work publicly, I can do less billboards for the hospital. Um, but when COVID hit, there was a, there's one example of a provider, a public health professional who um, made the YouTube video where he was wiping down his groceries at the very beginning of the pandemic. And I think he was out of MIT or another um, East Coast institution. Well, because of the iterative nature of science, and this is what kind of collectively people don't understand about what's happening with COVID and Fauci and everything else, that science is iterative. And so public health protocol is also iterative. So the things that we were teaching at the beginning, we have since come to understand better and differently and so the public health protocol has evolved so the guy who was wiping down his groceries puts it on youtube and does this really great public health education piece it goes viral in the meantime we've learned more about the disease to know that you don't have to wipe down your groceries and in the meantime that video went viral and he can't take it down and he can't stop it Mm, and he now is putting out public health education that isn't on point with the current protocol, right? And he lamented that in an article I was reading. Um, and that risk or of being lambasted by colleagues or by patients or, you know, where is the line of libel and slander and defamation? And that's where we walk together and where I support a lot of folks as how do we get out there but um, but position you in a way that, that you feel really confident. Um, and then how do we empower you with some tools so that you under, understand where the boundaries are and how to de-escalate issues? Because unfortunately, um, uh, science is under attack, and um, and the the democratization of information and dialogue that is so wonderful about the internet also had has its dark side, and I think we've all been privy to that, especially in the last couple of years. Yeah, that's that's some great takeaways, especially for you know society as it is now where we're very much like we want to be the first right we want to be the first to break the news we want to be the first to but it's also important to ensure that the information you're sharing is accurate you know it's it's it's, it's so important that this information is accurate and it's and it's not harmful to others especially if it's inaccurate information because too often inaccurate information can be harmful to others whether it's uh, you know an individual themselves or a culture or a community or you know a generalization mm-hmm. of an entire society, right? There's there's mm-hmm. just too much, um, to your point, um, grayness, right? Like you, what's mm-hmm. what's the difference between slander and defamation, right? And it's like there is very right. much of a very kind of unique line. Yeah, right. And um, context just matters so very much, and there is so much that. It's out of your control, but that's really important to consider around the context of the delivery of that message. And, um, and yeah, yeah, I had another example in my head as you were describing that, which was, um, oh, back in the day in corporate hospital systems, um, the other one would be, um, and more important than ever, or at least more visible and finally more invested in, is the idea of kind of equity 
in your messaging. And when you said, you know, everybody's on the internet, and I, I would have said yes two years ago. And in the last two years, Tiller has done more out of home marketing than we've ever had to do from an equity standpoint. So two, three years ago, we were putting out social media commentary that said, hey, decrease your corn intake and, you know, it shouldn't be a big part of your diet. Well, what does that mean for the Hispanic population mm. and what, you know, in other Latin mm, communities, yeah. like culturally indigenous communities? Yeah. Or we would say, hey, don't show a picture when you go on iStock of an older white male doctor leaning over a person of color, giving them some chronic condition message, right, that really looks punitive and looks like there's this really explicit power dynamic shown in that visual it's on a totally different level and now if i need to reach my um historically marginalized community who doesn't have access to the same information or health literacy level or who needs things in different languages or who has to keep going to work when the rest of us get to stay home then i need to start doing transit ads that have spanish translations it's just a it's a totally different game and it's a totally different consideration, even if we're talking about kind of digital communications on um, how we show up for people. Yeah. Um, it's, it's different. And, and thankfully, I guess it keeps keeps me employed. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So let's let's talk about the employment piece, because, you know, this is a business, right? Yeah. How did yep. you fund this business? How did you start the funding of this business? Grassroots effort? Did you go with like angel investors? Did you just kind of you know, just kind of start getting, you know, clients and start going, how, how did you build your business? Yeah, lean and mean for sure. Um, I was saving for a few months going into my transition and just kind of squirreling away dollars as much as I could um, and cutting costs in my own kind of home space. Um, okay, I don't need to eat out and I don't mm -hmm. need to buy that thing. Um, and then I mentioned I went half time, so I continued to have income and benefits, which was huge for me at the time. So that's a huge out of pocket that you're not thinking about is your retirement contribution and your health care when you walk away, especially if you are a provider right. of the health care costs. Um, Ooh, it's expensive. <laughs> it's, yes. it's expensive. Oh my gosh. And um, I'm a, um, just in my spare time, I work in hospice and I'm a death doula, and the cost of aging in America or dying in America. I think about it every day. So the idea of leaving my corporate gig and not continuing to contribute to a retirement fund of some sort, even if it's just a piggy bank, was a non-negotiable for me. So I had to figure out that in my budget. So doing that budget rundown and just knowing your numbers is, is pretty paramount when you're going to walk. Um, right. So I did that and then and mentioned I was able for the six months as I launched the business, kept healthcare and kept some semblance of a salary coming in. Um, and then I had one client when I came off and it was kind of an ongoing, it was a three month kind of training, but going from a one-off project to a retainer, like getting that first retainer client, because you are always grinding for the next month or the next quarter or the next something. You've always yeah. got to have your pipeline filled. Yep. And, um, and that was a really scary endeavor in the first kind of walk. Um, you feel like it's this precipice that you're going to just step off of the cliff. Um, but also, if you've got the energy and the drive and the, the passion in your belly to even consider the step, then you know that after that step, you're going to keep grinding, right? Like, yeah, totally. I think totally. It's a lot of, it's a lot more mental toughness than anything else. I like it, and you know, you mentioned too. This kind of isn't your first business because you've basically pivoted uh, multiple times, mm. right, to different yeah. businesses. What would you say has been difficult about this process? Oh, yeah. I forget how long we have together, so I'll try to be brief on that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I, I mentioned that kind of giving yourself permission to change course when it's not working. And I didn't pull out I, when I had launched um, Tiller originally and we were designed to be a, um, an agency that an arm of the agency that that supported cannabis clients I was getting small low budget clients that were really mission aligned that cared a lot about the industry and the planet and the people and then I was getting really high budget clients who were jerks and that didn't align with my values. Mm. And, um, and I tried to push that mountain, uh, that, that ball up the hill um, for longer than I should have. I should have pulled, the, pulled out earlier. I should have pivoted earlier. Mm -hmm. But I, you don't know until you're in it. Yeah, um, and yeah. so every time I get better and I start to smell, hmm, this is actually kind of a, a loss leader for me. I should shift. Or um, 
yeah, this isn't, is, you look around one day and you think, yeah, I'm, I'm doing it and it's working, but um, are you happy? Is this, does this feel good? Does this feel, yeah. are, you, are you continually moving into more alignment with the person that you, you, you want to be in the world um, and not in a cheesy way? So I would tell you, um, I haven't taken care of myself physically and it is a really physically demanding endeavor. And um, I had some health issues over the last six years just because instead of taking time off to go for a run or stepping away from the computer to drink water, um, I have been physically carrying the business. So I'll work longer and harder and not take time off and not take care of myself Mm -hmm. or meditate or do yoga or hang out with your friends. Um, And the business will not work if you don't like, Mm, yeah, you don't work. And so I would just say um, continually, it's going to be a work in progress, but continually giving your permission, yourself permission to change course when it doesn't feel right or not working and pull the plug. And that doesn't mean that you failed. It means that you're freaking smart for seeing that and being brave enough to say, actually, I'm going to do something different now. Yeah. Um, and then really investing in your physical health. Um, I think I took that for granted at the beginning. Nice. Now, do you feel like there's any having the previous experience in, in corporate America learning mm-hmm. kind of that, do you feel that there was like some easy points kind of transitioning mm-hmm. into this role? Yeah, I, um, I think let's see, six years in and not that it's a good or a bad thing necessarily, but um, I've been 100% referral based and that means that um Sometimes I get referrals of work that aren't really in my wheelhouse. Um, But I've never gone to get any business. I've never had to. Um, I think because I work my tail off at relationship development. And this town is a small one. And this town being Portland or the Northwest or, you know, where you've worked before. And then those people go on to other organizations and think of you and they're there. Um, And I think that's been really organic for me that I've, I cared pretty deeply about people and then that has um, that's benefited the business quite a bit. Um, so I don't, my new business is talking to people like you and um, make sure that I'm paying attention when you say on LinkedIn, Hey, I'm looking for this, that I think about my network and look for ways to help you. Um, that's what my new business strategy is. And that love feels it. really good. I love it. Organic and honest. I love it. Yeah. And now, now you mentioned, you know, you've kind of, gone through a lot you've pivoted you haven't you know you kind of mentioned you went through a bit of a health scare recently in the last couple of years Mm -hmm. because you've been so devoted on work what what advice would you give yourself would you change anything what advice would you give a younger jess yeah i um um kind of jokingly but absolutely not a joke is um to get yourself a great therapist um, I've been through a couple different therapists in the process and, and they've all helped me at different points in the journey. Yeah. Um, but for a while I was working with somebody, I was looking for a business coach for a long time and mm. had a, a lot of trouble finding somebody that was mm-hmm. a good fit for me. I had, um, you know, I guess, uh, generally speaking, I had older white men telling me how to run my business and it felt like, Ooh, I'm not sure you really understand the nuance and the, and the complexity of what I'm up against mm-hmm. as, a woman. Mm, Uh, And then I had some others that were really uh, more woo woo. And I wasn't in a place where I wanted to hold hands and and talk about things. Um, I really wanted to to go get it. I'm a hunter by nature. Um, I'm a salesperson by nature. And so it was really tricky to find myself somebody that, um, that could support me and inspire me in that way. And I actually found a therapist who specialized in working with entrepreneurs. And I was able to pull apart, uh, you know, your scarcity versus abundance mentality uh, and to roll around in the dirt of like what money equals to you because you are in the thick of how your value and your income align and what your value proposition is in the world. And if you don't have the same amount of money coming in every, how that makes you feel unsafe. I mean, those are some deep rooted things. And so somebody who just kind of was able to work through that or um, allow me to talk through that was really, really helpful. And um, it can be a really isolating experience. Um, At the end of the day, the book stops with you. 
And um, if you're unhappy or if you're happy, both of those things are your responsibility. And that is a totally freeing in, in the best moment. I feel most free by that, right? I'm clocking in. I don't have somebody micromanaging me. Yeah. And when I'm miserable, that's my responsibility too. Mm. And um, and so having a support system of your personal group, but also a trusted small business accountant, a trusted mental health professional, you know, some of those other kind of professional services were, were really important to me along the way. Nice. Now, You've you've been in this industry, you know, individually as a, a you know sole proprietor and entrepreneur for the last six years. You mentioned, but you've been mm-hmm. in it f- for even more than a decade, almost coming on two decades. What mm-hmm. advice would you have for individuals in this in the same industry of yours? What advice do you have for them? Mm. Mm. I was just reading something. Uh, first of all, like at a kind of base level community over competition. And I was just reading something from a Seth Godin piece um, that you could have, you could see a really um, full area or marketplace and you could see, wow, there's tons of consultants and businesses in this space. And you could see that and say, it's too crowded. There's no room for me. Or you could see it and say, wow, there must be a lot of need in that space. There must be a lot of opportunity in that space, right? If there's so many people building building practices. Um, that's what I see when I look at our space. I see a lot of people who say they do what I do. I know nobody does what I do the way that I do it because people buy my brain and my heart. Mm, they don't yeah. buy my Facebook post. And as a consultant, um, <laughs> I had a mentor tell me, um, you know, I'm often, I'm always certain, and I'm often right. When a a client buys a consultant, they, my job is to walk with them and to make them feel safe. Mm. And I don't have to be right all the time, but I'm right a lot of times. And, and that's why I feel, you know, like I have business being in this space. Um, But I would just say that there's, there is more than enough room for all of us. And uh, explicitly, if you are a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a person in any other historically marginalized group, you should um, increase your pricing by 20%. That's what I would tell you. Because um, you're not asking for it. And I interview and I work with people um, who maybe are more privileged um, and um, they ask for it and they get it. So I, mm-hmm. I just would say charge more. And go get it because there's room for everybody and there's really good work that needs to be done and a lot of people that need your help. I like it. I like the uh, community over competition. That's that's a that's oh, a yeah. quote right there, baby. I'm going to use that one for <laughs> oh, a good. while. I'm, hey. I'm going to run with that. I like good. it. Please do. Uh, so for, so the for, thank you so much for coming on first and foremost. But for the folks at home that are oh. interested in learning more about Tiller and learning more about Jessica, yeah. Cl- Jess Colombo, how do they do that? Where, yeah. where can they find you on the intro web? Oh my gosh, thanks for asking. I think I'm probably too findable all over the interweb. But um, LinkedIn is where I love to hang out and learn and connect with people. So Jess Colombo on LinkedIn. Twitter is another place where I love to get in conversation with folks. And then JessColombo.com is probably, I'm launching a whole new iteration um, of my brand in the new year. Nice. Please invest in your own brand, everybody. And yes. if you need hookups for that, I've got great creative people in my network. But um, JessColombo.com is probably the best place to to get to me. Perfect. Jess, thank you so much again for coming on the show, sharing your story. A lot of informative information. I think a lot of people are going to find a lot of value out of this one because I think this has a lot of value added to it. I'm very excited to actually be able to share it. Thank you again for coming on. I'm looking forward to you hopefully some future work and projects together as well. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.